Welcome brothers and sisters and young people. It's good for us to be here tonight to be encouraged and also to encourage each other in our walk towards the kingdom. Welcome any visitors to tonight with us. We're going to commence a new class series tonight and uh, that is Titus, Sound Teaching Leading to Godliness. And tonight's talk is Tidy, Healthy and Lovely. So let's join our voices through the words of hymn 364 to be followed by prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, thou who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should be not removed forever. Thou, O God, art a great God who looketh on the earth and it trembleth. You touch the hills and they smoke. We pray for the day when your name will be praised in all the earth when your word will go forth. We're very thankful for the authorities in this land who have allowed us tonight to gather in fellowship 
and the freedom to worship you. Unlike so many volatile places in this world, we do constantly think of our brothers and sisters worldwide who face daily threats and challenges to their very existence because they believe and they trust in the hope of the gospel. We see us a world full of instability, the poor are helpless, they're trodden underfoot, there are wars and violence, there is corruption, there is powerful weather events and a dramatic decline in morals, there are financial uncertainties, men's hearts, as your word clearly has prophesied, are failing them for fear. Yet in our hearts and minds is the knowledge that you will endure forever, that thou shalt arise and have mercy on Zion and shalt build up Zion when your Son, even Jesus Christ, shall appear in glory. Increase our faith through your word that we may all be part of thine inheritance who will serve thee with gladness and enter into thy gates with thanksgiving. We thank you for the blessing of fellowship and the encouragement and the assurance that can only come from your living word. It certainly does give us direction, hope and great comfort. Please be with Brother Andrew as he encourages us through the words of Titus to follow in the steps of our Lord and Master whose life truly reflects the character and the value of you and your word of truth. So be with us in all that we do as we ask these petitions through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll ask Brother Don Phyllis to come forward and read Titus 1 verses 1 to 4 to 2 verses 1 to 15. from Titus chapter 1 verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto one according to... uh, Is it preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, our Saviour. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Thanks, Brother Don, for that reading. We'll call upon Brother Andrew to lead us in our discussion tonight to the title, Tidy, Healthy and Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Brother Phil, and good evening, everyone. So in this letter to Titus, Paul is seeking to establish the truth and to establish the faith of the believers so that their belief might cause a change of behaviour, that their behaviour might adorn, make lovely the gospel, and that by doing that, they might support the preaching of the gospel. So in other words, so that they could be better disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by doing this, they could bring more disciples to to Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul wants to have happen to us from this message to Titus, which we'll see is written to us as much as it's written to those in Crete and to Titus. And we can pray that that's the outcome of our study over these three Bible classes. And we're not looking at it exactly uh, from the beginning through to the end. We will look at the first four verses in chapter 2 tonight. And next uh, class, the rest of chapter 1 and then uh, chapter 3. But uh, in order to keep up with where we are, there's some numbers in the uh, slides. And if you're interested in noting down some of those notes, you can keep track of that there. And um, then those that uh, would like to can transfer that into their Bibles quite easily. Now, our theme for the year comes from Titus 2, from verse 13. Just look at the context of this. You've got it open there in front of you probably um, to see that it's in a very interesting context. In verse 9, he says he speaks to servants to be obedient to their masters and he says that they shouldn't steal in verse 10 and that they should show all good fidelity, should be honest. And he says that so that they might adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour God our Saviour, isn't that the message of the gospel? God is saving mankind. Adorn the doctrine, the teaching of God our Saviour in all things. So that's what servants were to do. Because, he says, the grace of God that, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and it teaches us what we should do, and what we shouldn't do. Well, what we shouldn't do, we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. And we should live, he says, soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. And then our theme, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So it's not just that we're to look for the blessed hope. It is a blessed hope. We are blessed to have the hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord. It's, it's not just that, though. It's that we are to do that by denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So you can see from this context for our theme for the year that we've embellished it with the why. Why would we be looking for the blessed hope, because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, and what, what we should deny, the way we should live, 
because he says in verse 14, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us, purify unto himself a peculiar people, a set-aside people, zealous of good works. So that's the context. And because of that, our life is inspired to be different to the way it was before the grace of God appeared and brought salvation to each of us. So when, we've talked a bit about why and what, and we'll do a bit of when. When was Titus written? Well, Titus was written in the 60s, not the 1960s. It was a good decade from what I understand, uh, what I can remember. But um, the AD 60s, right? So, uh, and it was written between Paul's two imprisonments. And the first imprisonment of Paul, we remember, ended with his release. His second imprisonment ended with his death. And Paul's good news. What was Paul going about teaching? He was going about teaching that Christ was alive. He had appeared to him in person. And that the death and resurrection of Christ convinced men of sin. And that God had done everything needed for salvation. It was a message that he was taking to the Gentiles, people who didn't have that grounding in the Old Testament. And the letter to Titus was taken to Titus in Crete, as we see in chapter 3 and verse 13. It was taken to Titus in Crete. Whoops. That didn't work, did it? Need to turn it on. Sorry. So it was taken to Titus in Crete by Zenus and Apollos. So who was Titus? Well, Titus was a Greek speaking Gentile converted by Paul. We don't know when, but perhaps when Paul was in Antioch after he had been converted. And possibly or possibly on his first missionary journey in Pamphylia or Galatia. And Paul took this young man, this young Gentile man, Titus, to what we now know as the Jerusalem Conference in AD 49 or 50. And he asked the leaders of Jerusalem to make a very important decision at that meeting. And that was not to require non-Jewish or Gentile believers like Titus to be circumcised. And the leaders did agree with Paul. And they didn't insist that Titus should be circumcised. And they did that, Titus especially, and Paul, at great personal risk to themselves. And Titus later helped Paul at Ephesus during his third missionary journey, and he was sent there to Corinth, or from there to Corinth. And what did he take? He took the first letter of the Corinthians. And after assisting the ecclesia in Corinth, Titus took news of the Corinthian ecclesia back to Paul at Philippi. And Titus then took Paul's second letter to Corinth from Philippi to Corinth. So you can see that Titus is key to a lot of what Paul was doing. And after Paul's release from house arrest in Rome, Titus went with Paul to Crete, where Paul established ecclesias and left Titus in charge of the ecclesias. And that's the context for this letter. And when we come to the end of this letter, Paul asks Titus to meet him in Nicopolis, which is on the western coast of Greece. And we know from 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, that he then sent him on a mission to Dalmatia on his own. Dalmatia being modern Croatia. So, what is Paul writing about? By the way, that's where Crete is, if you don't know. So, it's a fairly large island in the Mediterranean, south of Greece. So... The problem was the Cretan elders. And I'm going to say Cretan, but if I, sometimes I say Cretan, that's the same word, but it's totally different 
to Cretans, okay? Cretans are a totally different thing. So, what is Titus being told in this letter? He's being told to teach the ecclesias on Crete about the link between belief and behaviour that should be the outworking of that belief. And why is he doing that? Because there is this problem in the ecclesia. And it's seen at the end of chapter 1 at verse 16. And he's talking about the leaders. And he says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. So Paul's talking about the arranging brethren of some of these ecclesias in Crete. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, or as the NIV says, unfit for doing anything good. So he's being told to teach the ecclesias, but he's also being told about these people. So Paul, what do you think of these people? They're detestable, they're disobedient, and they're disqualified. Pretty strong words, hey? So what is Paul being taught? What is Paul uh, asking Titus to teach? If we come to chapter 2 and verse 1, the next verse, he says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. There's a direct connection between what we read in verse 16 of chapter 1 and verse 1 of chapter 2. And Paul's saying that what Titus teaches, the sound doctrine, is the thing that will change people's hearts, that will lead to good behaviour. And what is it that Titus is to do? He's to teach, right? He didn't say, be novel. He didn't say, be different. Come up with your own stuff. Be esoteric. Develop your own crotchets. No. Titus has no role at all except to faithfully take God's word that had been given to him by the apostle and to pass it on to other faithful teachers who would then teach the ecclesias and teach others. And those people would in turn be built up to do good works. They'll be taught what sort of character and what behaviour emerges from sound doctrine. So, Cretans. Just as we are living in a culture in Australia, they were living in a culture in Crete. A culture that was marked by immoral excess. And Paul says that one of their own, in verse 12, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Right? Do you think Paul would have needed to say a word different to talk about Australia and the Australian culture? Always liars evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Well, I think Australian culture lords itself for that. It's proud of that, right? You just think about popular culture like reality TV and social media. That's what it's about. It's a culture that rubs off on us, whether we like it or not. It's a culture marked by people who are just always telling lies and even being proud of telling lies. And they fundamentally are evil. They're just feeding their faces a lot of the time. Of course, not everyone, but that's the nature of the culture, the distinctive character, if you like, of Australia. Right? Do you agree with me? I think... What Paul says of Crete can apply to Australia. It's not very attractive, is it? 
So the brothers and sisters in Crete were Cretans, right? And the brothers and sisters at Cumberland are Australians. We are still Australians, even though we're in Christ. And in fact, he reminds us in chapter 3, as we'll see in the third class, that their lives had been like those people in Crete. And perhaps it's unavoidable that the surrounding culture would rub off on them. But Titus was going to see that there was a transformation that had happened, that the gospel message had entered their hearts and that they had been transformed by it. They were now in Christ. They were still Cretans, but they're now in Christ. And it was the power of what Christ had done for them that was going to develop from within them a different character, a different culture, a different set of traits. It wasn't that they had exchanged one set of external circumstances for another, like you can do, dare I say it, walking in the door of the hall. After being a totally different person, just outside the gate. It's not a facade that's put on for attendance at the meeting. In fact, Paul doesn't say anything about attending meetings. And it's not a change that goes from a vile, putrid, swearing, brawling family behind closed doors that's all smiles and a pretense of holiness when everybody sits in their normal row in the meeting and dare I say it it wasn't that they had chosen to believe some deeply sublime intellectual set of doctrines or that they'd been excited by prophecy which we can be or even by the Yahweh name, which is important to know. No, it's not about those esoteric doctrines. It's about the work of God for them. The gospel message that had entered their heart, that had a personal effect on them and had changed them each individually. They'd opened their hearts to the transforming power of the gospel, the teaching of God, the word of God. You can think of John 16 verse 8 where the Lord said, when he, the comforter, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is, this is how Christ is affecting this work in the lives of believers. And this was what was going to motivate these people, to go back out into the culture of Crete. Whoops, wrong one, sorry. A culture where they would be taught to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live the self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age that Paul is encouraging Titus to teach them. They would go out into a culture that was marked by immorality and by evil and by excess, and they would be showing that they were not immoral, that they were good, and that they were self-controlled. They would be pure and good and self-controlled. They would be showing by what they did that they had been changed in their hearts. And this, when other people see this, adorns, it makes lovely the teaching, the doctrine of God our Saviour, the work that God has accomplished through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, he begins in verse 2 with the older men in the meeting. Teach the older men, he says. It's a really interesting place to begin, isn't it? The older men, perhaps if it were you or me, we might start with the young people, do you think? 
But no, he starts with a group of older men. And I guess I have to include myself in that description. He doesn't allow us a minute to think that older men are not capable of being affected by the culture around them. He would teach them that instead of being drunk, they would be sober. Instead of being liars and evil beasts, they would be worthy of respect. Instead of being lazy gluttons, they would be self-controlled. And instead of being detestable and disobedient, they would be sound in faith and in love and patience. Now, older brothers, there's a good few of us here tonight and probably a few watching at home. We shouldn't just gloss over these words. And if you're not sure if you're older, maybe decide for yourself. But remember that not so long after Paul wrote this, Pythagoras talked about the four ages of man. And they're basically about 20 years each and as young men. And there's, uh, there's, sorry, children, there's young men, there's older men, and then there's the dotage. And I know Dad's watching, he's more than 80, so I don't know if, what happens when you're uh, outside of the dotage. But... Um, What are these things that Paul is talking about here? Older brothers. Well, the first one is about drinking. Now, we have had problems with drinking from time to time. And he talks about being worthy of respect. We older brothers can't think that we deserve respect because of our age. God doesn't expect people to respect us unless we are worthy of respect. And as older brothers, too, we need to show that we are sound in faith, sound, healthy in faith. We are teaching healthy things that build up the faith of others and in love and in patience. Now, probably patience isn't the thing that us older men are renowned for. I think Paul's words are very relevant today. And then he goes on to talk about older sisters. And the older women in Crete were tipsy, full of gossip and useless talk. But the women of the ecclesias of Crete weren't going to be like that. They would not be slanderers, not addicted to much wine and teaching what is good. And the younger women. The younger women could be tempted by this culture in Crete. It could easily suck them in. But these young women were going to be totally weird. These young women were going to go to the older women to learn how to love their husbands, how to love their children, how to love being at home. So younger women, what does Paul really mean? Well, he isn't saying you shouldn't have an education and you shouldn't work. He's talking about where your priorities should be. And it's an important work that he's talking about. It's a real work with real accomplishments and with real fulfilment. Fulfilment from bringing up children who have also been transformed by the word of God. And when the marriage can truly fulfill the divine ideal of heirs together of the grace of life. That's the priority where it ought to be, regardless of what the prevailing culture around us says. And to be clear, Paul isn't making a rule that there shouldn't be, should be no education for young women or young sisters or no employment. 
He's saying make a home, not bricks and mortar, but generally the family, the husband and wife, they ought to make that a priority. And it's not despising or worse, even shaming people who don't have opportunity to do that or who are single. He's speaking to this group of younger sisters, perhaps typically the 20 to 40 year olds we might think. And our older sisters, again, perhaps 40 plus, maybe, taking that rule of thumb. Far from having no role in the meeting, they can teach this. Not teaching in a classroom setting or standing on the platform, but teaching in that sort of side-by-side, counselling, relationships sort of way. And I know there's some of that that goes on. It's good. I'm sure there's a lot more of it that could, but it needs the younger sisters to want to learn that from those with the hard-earned experience of what it takes and from those who can contribute all that learning of what works and what doesn't. So Paul has left Titus in Crete to shepherd and teach the Ecclesias. Crete is not a very nice place. The ancient historian sorry. The ancient historian Polybius had this to say. It's almost impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than in Crete. Now, we live in the last days. We know that, of course. And we frequently mention that. But reflect on what you... Reflect yourself on what we say amongst ourselves. I think you'd agree that we tend to think that public policy today is worse than it's ever been in mankind's history and that personal conduct today is more treacherous than it's ever been. And we sort of look at any sort of treacherous or irreligious thing that goes on around us and we start loudly proclaiming that it's a sign of the times but it's a threat to our discipleship. And indeed it may be. But let's keep things in perspective. Crete was also very bad. And whatever immorality unbelievers around us might choose to to do or what they might legislate to make legal, we know it might be against the law of Christ. Well, I'll say it again, it's none of our business. Let's mind our business and make sure that their business doesn't rub off on us. Because Paul's focus here is fundamentally about the ecclesia. It's internal. And Paul's concern for the ecclesias were that they would be tidy, healthy and lovely. So where do we get that from? In chapter 1 and verse 5, we see that he says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So the tidiness he's talking about is not a tidiness that comes from sweeping under the carpet uncomfortable truths or things we don't want to talk about or from pushing away embarrassing realities. This is a tidiness that comes from doing things God's way. And Paul's emphasis is on a particular kind of tidiness. A tidiness that comes from ensuring the leaders of the ecclesia are qualified. And Paul's strong message is that the problems in the ecclesia, and I think it's fair to say the problems in the ecclesia in any age, stem from bad leadership. 
It's not just a first century problem. And healthy. People who are teaching falsehoods, he says in chapter 1 verse 13, are to be rebuked sharply in order that they might be sound in the faith. They might be healthy in the faith. In other words, they'd be spiritually healthy. And at the beginning of chapter 2 that we've seen already, as you as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine, with healthy doctrine. That's what Paul was looking to see. Titus do. And lovely. He talks of the slaves, that they shouldn't be argumentative, they shouldn't be stealing. They should live in such a way that they adorn the gospel of grace, the teaching of God our Saviour. In other words, they make the story of the gospel attractive by the loveliness of their lives, their behaviour. Not their lives at the meeting, but their lives at work. He's talking to slaves. It's their lives at work, their lives out in society. The Cretans were being encouraged to be an attractive contrast to the people in verse chapter 1 and verse 16 who profess to know God but deny him by their actions. That gospel message hadn't transformed their heart and their behaviour. These were people who were religious, yes. They had a lot to say about God. But there was a dissonance. There was this lack of harmony between what they taught, or what they said, and what they did. There was a disconnect between their claims and their conduct and between the way they professed their faith and the way their faith functioned. And so Paul says, you should know that these individuals that we've seen already are detestable, disobedient, and they're actually disqualified. He's sort of saying there's no point giving them any job in the ecclesia. They'll just put the ecclesia at risk. That's what Paul's message is about. Now, he introduces his letter with a very long sentence over almost four verses. We looked at that as well. And it starts with Paul's position. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For Paul, it shows a humility, a servant of God. It was a position he hadn't won on the basis of his talents. No, no. He was now numbered with the other servants of God. You just hold your hand there and turn up Joshua chapter 1 and just see what God says about these other servants. Verse 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh. Verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Verse 7. Be careful to obey all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Verse 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you. Verse 15. Until Yahweh have given your brethren rest... You will return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, Yahweh's servant, gave you on this side, Jordan. And then at the end of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 29, what do we read of Joshua? It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died, being 110 years old. Paul was numbering himself with those servants of God. And Paul, we know, he wasn't lacking in credentials. He said in Acts 23, verse 6, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, right? He said that, that was to the uh, Sanhedrin. In Philip, to the Philippians, in chapter 3, he said, 
As to the law, he was a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the ecclesia. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. It's a striking thing that he introduces himself as a servant. Paul, what is your position? A servant of God and an apostle, he says. One sent. He's a servant of God that's been sent by Jesus Christ. Apostles. They're a very extraordinary and unique group of men, aren't they? They'd been with the Lord during his ministry. They'd seen the resurrected Lord. In Acts 9 verse 15, Luke tells us about Saul of Tarsus and his discovery that Jesus Christ was actually Lord. And Paul responds by saying to him, Who are you, Lord? And in the things that followed, Ananias is given the responsibility of nurturing and caring for this Saul of Tarsus Jesus had told him, he is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles. That's how he was set apart as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he says, I hath not seen nor ear heard in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10. Neither hath entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, says Paul, He has revealed it to us, meaning the apostles, by his spirit. And the apostles were given this revelation so that they in turn could speak the word of God and write the word of God. And that's important to understand and to remember. The apostles are long gone, aren't they? Right? They're dead. They're buried. So where do we have apostolic authority? Of course, it's not from, you know, the popes in Rome or anything like that. It's because God has breathed out his word and they wrote it down. The apostles have breathed it in and written it down for us. That's what he says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. They're long gone, but we can obey the word of God because it's the word of God. That's what Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. The things that ye have heard me say... What you've heard me say, you entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the same message as he's saying to Titus, isn't it? Who does Paul think he is? Well, he's saying, I want to make you to make sure the things you heard me say, you tell other men so that those other men can tell other men. It's, it's his authority as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. But it's God's word. And the only way... We can find out God's word or what Jesus did or what Jesus would have us do is in the Bible. It's not in our heads. It's not in our imaginations. It's not from a theologian. It's in the scriptures. And even our arranging brothers don't have, and nor do the arranging brothers of Crete, they don't have apostolic authority, even if at times perhaps that sort of claim might seem to be made. So Paul says to Titus, here I am, Titus. And this tells us that, sorry, let's move through these slides. meant to put them up for you. (laughs) Sorry, kids. That tells us that more than just being a private letter that Paul is writing to Titus, this is also designed to be read in public. Why would he be telling Titus he was a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ? Titus would say, well, of course, I know that. It was because Paul intended this letter would be read by us tonight, as it were. A public reading like we're doing here. And so that people who were hearing it would be reminded who Paul was, where his authority really lay. And this is the basis of his humility as a servant of God. And that's the first thing. His position as a servant and as a sent one. And secondly, there's his purpose. Why is he a servant of God? Well, he tells us there in that uh, first verse. As the NIV says, 
to further the sake of God's elect, or as the ESV says, for the sake of the faith of God's elect. For the sake of the faith of God's elect. He's writing it for the faith of God's elect. God's elect. God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and he called Abraham to himself, and he made promises to Abram, the privileges that would flow from God, the promises, and tell him that through him would all seed all would through his seed would all nations of the earth be blessed. And he said, For I have chosen him. Why did he say that? Because I know that he will direct his children and his household after him in the way of Yahweh by doing what is right. The sake of the faith of God's elect. Was he talking about Abram's seed? Not his literal seed, of course. But we have also the record of what God was doing with his literal seed. Turn up uh, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6 to 8. What do we see there? Thou art an holy people unto Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God has chosen you to be a special people, chosen you to be a special people above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Yahweh did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number, for you were the fewest, but because Yahweh loved you and because he would keep the oath which he'd sworn, the promise he'd made to the fathers. That's the reason Yahweh brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And that's why Israel still remained God's people, even though they don't follow God's law. And we know from the New Testament that the apostles used that very same language to talk about followers of Christ, the believers. Paul said in Galatians, the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. The children of God before Christ are redeemed by the same sacrifice, the same work of God that had been accomplished, spoken of in the promises in Eden and the promises to Abraham, the law of Moses. And we, who are the children of God after Christ, are redeemed by the same sacrifice. Come to 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. What do we read there? You are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's the same message as Paul is telling Titus to preach, teach to the ecclesias in Crete. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. They were elect, they were chosen, that they might declare the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvellous light. John Carter wrote this, and excuse me reading it, but um, you've got it up there. He says, Oh, when he's writing on Ephesians. Not every individual of the nation was acceptable to God, as Paul says. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The election was illustrated in Elijah's day by the 7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal. So there's this small group who had obtained it. And it consisted of those who gave ear to the message of God's prophets, who heard it, for the time to come, and he quotes Isaiah 42. And then he, then he picks up the example of this cluster of grapes. The remnant is compared to the new wine in the cluster of grapes, for the sake of which the bunch was not destroyed. This new wine, and for us it's the new life in Christ. You know, if we've got that and we're part of that, then the bunch is not destroyed, but a blessing would come, and the individual's that are thus represented by the new wine, are God's servants, a seed out of Jacob, the inheritors of my mountains, my elect and my chosen. And he quotes again Isaiah 65. And the class who respond to God's word 
are addressed by him as Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So isn't it practical, a practical doctrine that in the face of everything that might threaten to unhinge us and to undo us, whatever happens in our lives, the children of God can rest in the security of the initiative of God. It's what he says in Romans 8 and verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring anything against those whom God hath chosen? And so on. So, when the elect of God, we the elect of God, are made aware of our own propensity to wander and to stray, and our security can be found in the fact that we have been loved by God from the foundation of the world in the work that he accomplished in his son. Isn't that an immense thought? And when he comes to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, He chose us in him before the creation of the world in order that we should be holy and blameless in his sight. That's why he chose us. We're not part of the elect if we're not the friend of God, if we're not desirous of that same holiness that he's talking about here. If not like Abraham, we've been counted blameless in his sight. And we're not saved if we try or think we can make ourselves acceptable to him. He's saying we have been saved. We have been chosen in Christ so that we can become holy and be held blameless in his sight. That's exactly what Paul goes on to say, would characterise the true believers in Crete. He's furthering their faith, that's his purpose. He's furthering their faith and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. He wanted them to grow in faith because of his calling as an apostle and the letter that he'd written to them and to grow in the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, that leads to those lovely lives that would then go on to preach the truth to others. And why, where does God's predestination and election come into this question of why he would need to even write this? Well, he says in Ephesians 1 verse 11, in him we, the apostles, were also chosen. We have been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first to put the hope of to put our hope in Christ, the apostles were the first to put their hope in Christ in verse 12, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, he says, the promised Holy Spirit, which is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So Paul and the apostles were the first to put their hope in Christ so that they might be to the praise of his glory. And you then heard the message of truth from those apostles and the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him. And then the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit being talked about here from uh, Acts 2. No, this is the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, the indwelling word in ours that changes our hearts so that we can be holy and blameless in his, in his sight. It's not some remarkable change that we make from the outside. It's something from within, when his word truly finds a place in our hearts. It's not instant thing. It's an ongoing work. It's something that turns us to become to the praise of his glory. And so he says in Ephesians 1 verse 9, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, 
which he purposed in Christ. The mystery of his will in our lives. Think about that. We can reflect on how the work of God has brought that to come to pass in our lives. How do we learn of Christ? What was it that brought us to the point of realising that we were truly sinners and that we needed God's forgiveness? Who was it that truly opened to us the mystery of God's word? The mystery of God's work of redemption. And the reality of that doctrine, it's God's work from Eden. It's, it's more than that, though. It's his calling to preach, isn't it? Because if nobody's there to give the message, then nobody's heart will be changed. No, no gospel message will enter people's hearts. It's the change that comes about in our hearts that's wrought by the power of his word. And it's a life of godliness, the eternal life, as he says. If we've been truly saved, we've been sanctified and live sanctified lives. It's not that we have eternal life now, of course, as measured by its length, but it's the quality of our life that has an eternal quality, godly lives that we live in the faith of the Son of God. And what is that faith? Well, it's a faith that Christ died for us and the recognition that we are sinners. And if we are called, then we are called to preach the gospel to every man, right? It's not that every man is elect, of course. It's that every man in whom that preached message rests and finds good soil, and that picture of the parable springs up into fruitfulness, the rich eternal life that we heard about on Sunday night, an eternal life of good works that Paul's encouraging these believers in Crete to adopt. So we don't really have a problem calling ourselves saved, do we? If we're not saved, what are we? Surely we're lost. We're not that. And if we're not forgiven, what are we? We're still condemned. What's the issue? Well, the issue is, I think, pride. We want to think that we can do something. You know, we can be saved by something that we do. Well, even baptism, we want to think that that's something we have done. Well, it, it's not a cause for applause and backslapping, right? It's, it's, it's not some great achievement. It's just the outworking of that change that's happened in our hearts. Because we are special and different, God has called us to do something special and different and said that he accepts us. He's called us to change us. It's God's work, not ours. And we can contr can't contribute anything to our salvation. God's making us new from the inside out. Not making ourselves new from the outside in. So the position Paul had was as a servant and as an apostle. And the purpose he had was for the furtherance of the faith of God's elect. And finally, he introduces us to his partner. He says, to my son in the faith, to Titus, my true child in the common faith. Father-son relationships in the common faith are important. We need to build them. We need to maintain them. And we need to cherish them like Paul clearly did. And may we be truly transformed by the renewing of our minds. Brother Andrew certainly has challenged us to be personally transformed by the gospel so that we might live self-controlled, upright and godly lives now in this present age, lives of faith. The following announcements will take place, if it be 
the will of our Heavenly Father. Sunday morning to preside Brother Mike Beard, to exhort Brother Johnny Phyllis, and Sunday evening is the baptism of Dee Wigsell, and if we can all bring something, a plate of food for supper. Next Bible class is to be uh, on Isaiah, and the speaker is Brother Dan Hill. So let's conclude our night with the words of Appendix 11 to be followed by prayer. Heavenly Father, we conclude our evening together with praise and thanks unto you. We all acknowledge your holiness and supremacy, for you are a great creator and a loving God who has provided us with an abundance of blessings. We have been reminded that your desire is for each of us to show in all aspects of our lives a pattern of good works both in doctrine, speech and actions, which show that we are following in the footsteps of our Master and that we love you and desire to respond to your kindness and the love that you have for us. We know that works of righteousness will not of themselves save us, but your abundant mercy and grace and the washing of our sins through Jesus Christ our Saviour. May each of us be all the more inspired, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. May the words and the attitude of our Lord be always the focal point of our conversations and the basis for all of our decisions and our desires. 
We pray that each of us may be granted safe travel home until we meet again. And we ask all these things through our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.